This week, we're going to be finding out all about moon trees, what they are, where they are, and how did they get there. And to do this, we're joined by Rosemary Rusa, president of the Moon Tree Foundation and daughter of Apollo 14 command module pilot, Stu Rusa. Have you visited a moon tree? Let us know and share your photos with us. We're at Space and Things 1 on Twitter and at Space and Things Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. And why not hit that share button if you're enjoying the podcast and help us reach your spaceflight loving friends. But right Right now, it's time for episode 82 of the Space and Things podcast. You're listening to Space and Things with Dave Giles and Emily Carney. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles, and welcome to episode 82 of our podcast. How you doing, Emily? I am hanging in there. Uh, I, as many of you know, I, I had a surgery last week, and it went very well. Uh, I'm still... Excellent news. Yes, I, I'm still recovering from it. I'm, I'm feeling a little tired today, but other than that, I'm well on my way to getting better in a few weeks and, and being totally back to normal. So I'm, I'm very pleased. My doctor did a pretty good job, so I'm very happy about it. That is exactly what we like to hear. Now, yeah, actually, we weren't sure whether you were going to be with us this week. We decided to leave it till fairly last minute to make the decision, right? Yeah. Um, so it's great that you're here with us this week. And uh, it means we've got a spare episode in the bag, Emily, as well, which is always yes, nice. Yes, that is always good. <laughs> Now, this week, we had to come up with something quite last minute, partly because Emily's available, but also because, unfortunately, we saw a post go up last week on Facebook, which let people know that our friend George Fatalitas had passed away suddenly. I met George through Space Hipsters. I'd been following his posts of his travels around the US as he visited air and space museums and places of interest to do with space flight. And we connected because of that and because I was planning my own trip in 2019 for the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11. He gave me loads of advice and even sent me some things across the pond, which he felt might help me on my way. It was a really nice thing to have done from someone who at that point was a complete stranger. But you see that happening quite a lot in Space Hipsters. It really is a wonderful community. We actually met in real life on that trip as well, on July 20th at the Houston Space Centre, where we enjoyed a meal together and then watched a panel featuring Walt Cunningham, Glenn Lunny and Bill Moon. It was great to spend a few hours with someone who absolutely understood what I was doing and why. And when I got home, there was something in the post for me as well. He'd made a t-shirt for the two of us which said, Apollo 11 50th anniversary road trip, as he was on pretty much the same trip as me over the course of that year. In fact, the only crewed NASA spacecraft he hadn't seen was in London, the Apollo 10 command module. And he was planning on coming over to see it as soon as he could. So uh, it's a real shame that he wasn't able to do that. And I was also hoping to see him later this year uh, if I got over for the Apollo 17th anniversary. Anyway, his death was a real shock. If you're in the Space Ipsos Facebook group, then you will almost certainly have seen him post something about some of his travels he absolutely loved visiting places and sharing their stories and he loved paying his respects to our heroes too i imagine that there is probably not anyone else with a knowledge of where deceased astronauts are buried i know that sounds a bit morbid but he just went and visited and paid his respects or he knew where the tribute places for them if they had a bench if they had a tree he knew all of that uh he was fascinated to find as many apollo artifacts as he could and he was actually writing a book about his travels as well uh he was always upset that things were either missing or destroyed uh, and one of the things he was trying to do was locate and visit as many of the moon trees as he could in particular the ones that weren't marked or the locations of ones that used to exist that have now died or have been destroyed so because of that and as a little tribute to george we thought we'd do a show about the moon trees it's just a small thing that we can do to pay tribute to george and his efforts to make sure that we all know as much as we can about the space program even the things which might seem a little bit trivial uh, in a post on space hips as he said we are losing moon landing artifacts these trees are the only connection to the apollo era that we can protect I hope that we can protect a few more for you, George, buddy. So on Monday, we sent a message to the Moon Tree Foundation and asked if they could join us this week. And we're absolutely delighted to say that as a result today, we're joined by Rosemary Rusa, the president of the foundation and the daughter of Stuart Rusa, Stu Rusa, the Apollo 14 command module pilot who is an essential part of the Moon Tree story. 
In 2019, Rosemary released a book called To the Moon, an autobiography of an Apollo astronaut's daughter, which you really should consider adding to your collection. So let's get this interview started. Okay, Houston, uh, we've hit it twice, and it sure looks like we're closing fast enough. I'm going to back back out here and try it again. Back up. Rosemary. Thank you so, so much for joining us today, especially such last minute. I really appreciate it. Um, so let's go back to the beginning. What is a moon tree? <laughs> that is the number one question I get. What <laughs> is a moon tree? So obviously nothing grows on the moon. There is no atmosphere. I used to say there's no water, but they seem to suspect there might be some water there, but obviously there's there's nothing that grows on the moon. It is a magnificent desolation, as one of the astronauts called it. So these are not trees that came from the moon. However, my father used to be a smoke jumper prior to him joining the Air Force and NASA. And so each of the Apollo astronauts were allowed to take some personal items with them. And in an ode to the forestry service and um, for his days as a smoke jumper, they decided to take some tree seeds. And so they stayed with him in his PPK, which is called the personal preference kit. And so a little canister of tree seeds, seeds that would rep represent all of the United States. There were five different varieties um, oh, nice. wound up traveling to the moon and back. And so they affectionately dubbed them moon trees. Fantastic. So so when they got back, they just planted the seeds all over the country and they're still there? Or is that how this was working? Well, since it was not really kind of an official NASA experiment, uh, the seeds wound up going some to my father, some to other astronauts, some to friends. But the bulk of them wound up going back to the Forest Service. And so they went to two different locations in the United States. Uh, one here where I live in Mississippi and uh, the other two, California. And so they wound up growing the seeds uh, to see if deep space or radiation or the coldness or the harshness of space would affect the growth of the trees. And so they found out they did not. But the Forest Service basically started handing them out mostly during the bicentennial of the United States in 1976. <laughs> Right. So how many trees are, are there left? And are there any seeds left from that original trip? Anything that hasn't been planted from from the original batch of seeds or, or are they all gone now? So there are no more original moon tree seeds. Uh, the last known seed that I am aware of, my father and I planted together oh, nice. in the late 1970s, early 1980s when we were living in Austin, Texas. And, and I was outside and he, he came out and he said, um, you know, this is the last of the seeds that I have. Shall we plant it and see if it grows? And and so I said, sure. So we did. And it, it is there. It's at our uh, former home in Austin, Texas. Amazing. And it's an American sycamore. And that, as far as I know, is the last of the original uh, moon tree seeds. And part of the goal of starting the Moon Tree Foundation was a lot of the original trees are just dying off are they've been hit by a natural disaster or people just don't know and they've cut them down so out of the original about 450 seeds that were uh, germinated there's only about 70 or so original moon trees left wow. so i just couldn't let this beautiful living legacy to the apollo program and to my father just go away so that's why we started the moon tree foundation Oh, wow. Living legacy. That's such a beautiful way of putting it. Such a lovely expression. And yeah, I suppose in the future, they will be the only living legacy. That's rather morbid. Yes. And, and I really, I, we love to teach the kids and inspire the kids. And of course, there's only a handful of the, well, there were only a handful, you know, 24 astronauts that went to the moon, but but there's only four moonwalkers left. And of mm. course, my father passed away in 1994. We He's buried up at Arlington National Cemetery with my mother, and we have a beautiful headstone with the Apollo 14 patch and the Saturn V rocket. But, but yeah, soon these are going to be the only really living thing from the Apollo era. 
Yeah, that's uh, really humbling to think about. Um, so, um, and when was the Moon Tree Foundation started, and what are the aims of this foundation? So, the Moon Tree Found Foundation actually, I started in 2011 during the 40th anniversary of Apollo 14. Right. And but then I wound up becoming the executive director of a museum, and and it kind of just went by the wayside a little bit, but I, I kicked it back in just a few years ago in celebration of the 50th anniversary of the of the moon landings. And so for the last several years, been been dedicating a majority of my time to that besides writing a book uh, called To the Moon. But um, our goal is to unite, inspire, and conserve. So we're not as focused on the history, although we do uh, rededications of the original moon trees, but our goal is really to plant second generation moon trees and just and kind of inspire the next generation to reach for the stars and have a goal to walk on the moon. And we also want to show conservation and who can argue with planting a tree and particularly a tree whose descendants went 240,000 miles in this space <laughs> and back. <laughs> That's amazing. So one of our uh, Patreon subscribers, Ed, has asked this. Is there any way uh, you can get saplings from moon trees? I am part of a scout's troop, and I'm thinking we could plant the trees in uh, George Fatalitis' honor. Is that something people can do? Yes. So I work with the Forest Service as well as a nursery. And so I do not grow the trees, but I, I work with those who are experts in tree growing and so we do go around and we have moon tree ceremonies and they're nice. always very magical and very special and it gets everyone very excited. So that's that's mostly what we do. Uh, we tailor each of our ceremony to to what it's all about. So, yes, if we want to do it in honor of a person or at a school or a park or um, about to go to Houston, Texas for Charlie Duke's uh, Apollo 16 50th anniversary. And we are going to plant two moon trees at Webster Presbyterian Church. And they, it was the same church that gave Buzz Aldrin the wafer and the chalice when he landed on the moon and did communion before wow. stepping out. So, so that's going to be a special ceremony. So yes, we go around to wherever you would like a moon tree and I think it would be a beautiful thing to honor this person. It'd be fantastic. We've got another question from a Patreon subscriber. This is from Don Irwin and I love this question. He says, uh, do you know of any furniture or other mementos made from the wood of a moon tree? <laughs> that's a great question. I have here at my home, a part of the original moon tree from Kennedy Space Center. Nice. Unfortunately, it it uh, got hit during a hurricane uh, right when they were about to propagate some saplings from that tree. And so a gentleman carved it. And so I have it here. But I think he took some of the wood from the trunk of that tree and has made pins and and they also did a beautiful piece at the Kennedy Space Center at the Saturn V Center out of using some of the, the wood from the original moon tree. So I don't know of any furniture per se, but I think there are a few mementos out there. I don't do that, but it would be an interesting piece. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Do you have a favorite location for one of the moon trees? Oh, gosh, we have been at, all over the world uh, planting moon trees. Um, I think one of my favorite locations is the Kennedy Space Center uh, back in 2019 for the Apollo 11 50th. Uh, we wound up planting a moon tree garden and oh, nice. we have a tree there for each of the Apollo missions, including the Apollo 1 mission. But um, so it's a beautiful garden and they did a statue to the Apollo 11 crew and it's just it's very special. But I I, I don't know. I guess my favorite would be I, I planted a moon tree smack dab in the middle of my front yard and I'm uh, <laughs> kind of launching. And every time I walk out there, I kind of look at the moon and look at the tree and think of mom and daddy and all the accomplishments and all those brave souls who went out there. And uh, so I, I guess, I guess my own moon tree is my favorite. <laughs> I know your dad was a smoke jumper. 
uh, long before he orbited the moon. Do you think that experience for him really, I guess, inspired him to take up such a project like this that that has kind of a conservationist, uh, you know, sort of a bent to it? Well, my father was always an outdoor person. Uh, when he was a little boy, he grew up in rural Oklahoma. And so he loved the outdoors. He loved to hunt fish. Uh, he would go out hunting with his dog named Skippy. So he he always was a nature lover. And so when us kids came along, you know, he we, we had some land outside of Houston that we would go to on the weekends. We called it the place. And the trees were very special to him. And I guess after working with the, you know, with the Forest Service, I don't know if he had the foresight, you know, of, of what it would turn into because it is a beautiful legacy. But but uh, trees were always very special to him and the outdoors. All right. Uh, <laughs> this is completely unrelated to moon trees. And Dave's probably going to be <laughs> like, oh, God, why did she ask this? <laughs> Your dad was probably one of the most snazzy dressers of the Apollo astronauts. <laughs> Can you tell me who gave him his fashion sense or how did he get it? Because uh, I've seen some of his pictures. He got the he had the white shoes going. He was very uh, stylish. So let, let's talk a little bit about this. Has nothing to do with moon trees. And I apologize. <laughs> That's OK, Emily. My mother dressed my father. My mother <laughs> yes. loved fashion. She just always had a sense. Her her mother sewed a lot of clothes when she was growing up. But uh, my mother actually went to grade school with Elvis Presley uh, in Tupelo, Mississippi from the sixth to the eighth grade. And But her father was a veterinarian. So they had means and she would regale me with stories of growing up and having these big balls and and dance cards. And so she had a sense of fashion and she, she was always kind of cutting edge. So my mother dressed my father. He didn't like to shop, (laughs) but the one thing he did like was his white shoes. And she told him the proper etiquette was you can't wear white shoes before Easter and you don't wear uh, white shoes after Labor Day. So every Easter he would uh, get a new pair of white shoes and he adored them. He loved them. And basically he wore what what my mother said for him to wear. (laughs) Oh man, I love that. That's such a great story. That's amazing. And seeing as we've taken this tangent, I might as well carry on. What is it like knowing people who get dramatized in movies and films and get spoken about in documentaries? When you watch those things... Uh, do you recognize your father within those actors or do you find it frustrating? It's always weird when they say the person's name and because I know the real astronauts and I've, I've been around them my entire life. I grew up with them. And, and when they call someone an actor, you know, from a different name, it does throw me off a little bit. My father was a very unique astronaut. He He was not as flashy. He was, he was a family man. He was quiet, but he had always a sparkle in his eye and kind of a mischievous sense of humor. Uh, So he liked to pull kind of practical pranks and things like that, but he was not a very boisterous person. And usually his roles get overshadowed by Alan Shepard, which is a great story. You know, Alan Shepard, of course, our first American in space, and then at the Apollo 13, uh, Alan Shepard put, you know, the Apollo program back on track. So a lot of movie roles kind of get overshadowed with with that aspect. But I knew my father and I knew the way he was. And he was always very, very well respected within the astronaut corps. He was quite intelligent. He was, um, I mean, I hate to use this term, a good old boy, because then the People underestimated him a little bit. Um, He was not a country bumpkin, as they kind of say, but he was quite intelligent. Very, very good. He was a good stick and runner man. And um, Alan Shepard handpicked my father and Ed Mitchell for the Apollo 14 crew to the consternation of some of the other astronauts who, you know, who were, they were all vying for a flight. But he, he, uh, knew he could trust my father uh, with the command module and, and, you know, he said, I want to get home. And mm-hmm. daddy brought him home. 
course. One other thing is uh, we mentioned it in the introduction before we started talking to you, but you released a book in 2019 and you mentioned it, To the Moon, uh, an autobiography of an Apollo astronaut's daughter. I think it's a great book, by the way. I uh, really oh, love it. You. Did you have any thoughts uh, that you wanted to share with people about your motives to write in that? Well, I, I'm so fortunate to have grown up in that atmosphere. And, and, and I'm just really so fortunate to have the parents that I had. And, and the book really, it was, it's an adventurous book. There is a book out there called Smoke Jumper Moon Pilot by Willie Mosley. And he goes into my father's childhood and, and pre-NASA and, and NASA and then post-NASA. So it's not a book about my father. I just really wanted to talk about what it was like being the child of an Apollo astronaut and, and really the love um, with my parents. And, and it's a linear book. You know, I start off where I take the reader to the moon and back, and then I just kind of start in on my life and go to present day. But I always weave something space related into every chapter. And so it was really just an ode to my parents who taught me so much and, and really just to be adventurous. And that's kind of the essence that I would like to just share with everyone is just be who you can be and just be the best at it. I love that. And the, the artwork for this book, Emily, I don't know if you, I'm sure you've seen it, the, the champagne with the command module coming out. It's amazing. So the cover was designed by my stepdaughter and nice. um, I love champagne. And so after my parents passed away and particularly when, you know, after my father passed away, um, I would go and take a bottle of champagne and, and I would go and find the moon and I would take the cork and, and I would pop it and I would yell to the moon and <laughs> kind of toast to my parents. And so that's been kind of the tradition uh, when I'm around the astronauts or their families, we always get a bottle of champagne and we take it out and we, find the moon again and we pop it and we all yell to the moon. So that's been going on for several years now. And, and so when I was trying to design the cover, um, my husband, Francisco's daughter, uh, she's a, a graphic art designer and she just nailed it on the first try. And so, as you can see, it's the bottle of champagne, but instead of the cork, it's the command service module from Apollo 14. And so it's just uh, a way of cheering to them. Well, I like the cover even more now I've heard that. Anyway, Rosemary, thank you so much for joining us. This has been really wonderful. And uh, best of luck with everything to do with the Moon Tree Foundation. We'll be directing our listeners to your website, so hopefully they can get involved too. Oh, well, thank you so much. And uh, I hope all your viewers, next time they go out and look at the moon. Maybe they'll pop a cork themselves and, oh, nice. and cheers. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we better back up here and uh, think about this one, Houston. Right there. Whoa. <laughs> that was wonderful. That was absolutely wonderful. Yeah, I love Stuart Rusa. I'm very sad that I never got the opportunity to meet him because he passed very young. Yeah, 94, wasn't it? Yeah, he passed away when I was in high school and I, I never got the chance to meet him. I read the book about him by uh, Willie Mosley, and, uh, you know, I've talked to some other astronauts who've discussed him a little bit. I know Al Warden liked him a lot. He just seems like such a cool cat. Like, uh, I feel a little embarrassed I asked Rosemary about this, but he was always just really, like, snazzy looking, like, just, sh like, really sharp. And I think it says a lot about him that Alan Shepard, like, handpicked him to be the command module pilot, because Alan Shepard wanted to get home. So yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it says a lot for sure. Yeah, that was that was a wonderful interview, and and I just loved the whole idea of a moon tree. I just think it's brilliant, and it's such a wholesome thing, such a lovely thing to be doing. And clearly, I need to go and see more of these trees. Yeah, it, it's nice that um, I don't mean to sound negative here, but obviously the Apollo astronauts are getting you know up in age. I, I think Borman and Lovell are like 94 now, which is to me just mind blowing. You know, it, it's just it's nice to have something that's still around from Apollo because unfortunately there's going to come a time where, you know, that's just something there's going to be nobody available to talk about it, you know, with yeah. us every day. You know, I think, man, I would love to talk to Al Warden about this. And then you realize, oh, crap, you know, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you can't. So it, it's lovely to have something that is a living legacy from this amazing 
time. For sure. As always, you can watch the full unedited interview if you've signed up to be one of our Patreons, which you can do at patreon.com slash space and things. And within the show notes, we'll have links to all things Rosemary Rusa and the Moon Tree Foundation. You can find them by clicking the link in your podcast provider or heading to spaceandthingspodcast.com. I'll also be putting some links in the show notes to some other websites about moon trees where they have a list of some of them and where you can go and visit them, which I think is fairly useful. But essentially, the link you need is moontreefoundation.com and there you can go and help out Rosemary in what she's trying to do. And so on to this week's news and sport. <laughs> there have been four launches since last week's recording. One in China, one in Kazakhstan, one in Florida, and one in Russia. All details and videos, if they're available, can be found in our show notes, as mentioned earlier. Now, there are two launches which are worth noting here. The SpaceX Falcon 9 launch on Saturday the 19th of March was the 12th time a first stage booster was reused for a launch, which is a new record. I still don't think we know how many launches those boosters will be able to perform before they're retired, but the shenanigans of SpaceX are continue to leave me gobsmacked. The other launch worth noting was the day before. On Friday the 18th of March, Roscosmos launched a Soyuz 2.1A carrying three cosmonauts to the International Space Station and they arrived just three and a half hours after they launched. Uh, you may have seen some talk about these three cosmonauts who changed out their spacesuits into some yellow and blue flight suits, which got a lot of people talking about it being a protest from the cosmonauts about the war in Ukraine. However, the outfits were packed weeks before the conflict started and the colors are their university colors they all went to the same university just so happened to be incredibly bad timing for ros cosmos uh, it may not have been a protest but it sure looked like one uh, interesting note about this launch it was the first all russian cosmonaut crew in 22 years yeah that makes sense because they've been flying with the americans so yeah that makes a lot of sense that's crazy and while we're talking about that situation, there are a few updates. SpaceX will now be launching the OneWeb satellites. Uh, we discussed this in depth a few weeks back, so hopefully you know what we are talking about. Also, the member states of the European Space Agency have voted to suspend the joint ExoMars mission with the Russians, which was due to launch later this year. The mission is another Mars rover mission, and the rover, which is actually being assembled in the United Kingdom, is being stored away until a new way to launch it has been found. It's been announced that the suspension is likely to, to delay the mission until, geez, 2026 at the earliest. I know, it's not good at all, but yeah. moving on to something more positive. Uh, the biggest story of this week undoubtedly was the rollout of the Artemis 1 rocket at Kennedy Space Center on the 17th of March. Now, if you follow us on Twitter, you wouldn't have missed this at all because I retweeted images left, right, and center, and I was having the best time. It felt like such a huge event. This is the first time that a rocket designed to take humans to the moon has rolled out of the vehicle assembly building in nearly 50 years, and after all the delays and years of uncertainty, there it is on the launch pad. Uh, we got to see the crawler back in action as well, which was fantastic. Uh, the, this rocket is due to launch later this year without a crew, but if it's successful in delivering the Orion spacecraft to the moon and back, then we'll see a crew mission within a couple of years for the first time in my life and in your life, Emily, as well, you know, both our lives. Yes. It feels like we're actually going to the moon again. It's very exciting. And, and all the images really did remind me. Uh, and there were so many parallels with that and the, and the um, images we've seen of the Saturn V rockets on the way to the pad. Really, really quite surreal. Yeah, I spent uh, last, I think it was last Thursday on the couch watching it because uh, I couldn't be there, but I, I did watch it and it was really cool. There's a really famous photo of Apollo 16 on the launch pad at dusk, like the sun's just going down. I think Tom Usiak took the photo and uh, there's a picture somebody did of it and it looks almost like the same photo just, you know, 50 years later. It, it's just incredible to me, you know, the... Uh, I'm trying not to draw parallels because, of course, it's a, a slightly different program, you know, but it's just it's really cool that we're 
finally seeing something like this during our lifetime. I, I wish it was a little earlier, but that's fine. I I'll, I'll I'll take it. I'll take it. Yeah, absolutely. I love the fact I don't know if it was intentional, but the way they uh, started to roll out as the sun was going down as well. It just added so much and then eventually arriving at the pad in the dark with all lit up with the big beams on it. It was just so romantic. Uh, yes. <laughs> and for us uh, space flight nerds, romance and rockets, you know, it just goes hand in hand, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, I'm, I'm supposed to go to Yuri's night on April 16th next month. And I'm hoping to see it for my with my own eyes. You know, even from a distance, I'm looking forward to to just seeing that with my own eyeballs. And I'm hoping I can get out there to see the launch later this year. We'll we'll see. That would be pretty cool. Yeah, I'll keep an eye out for the date for that. That's for sure. Yep. In more very good news, the James Webb Space Telescope has now fully aligned its main mirror and is performing better than it had been designed to. On March 16th, NASA published the telescope alignment evaluation image, and it is stunning. It's a single bright star with galaxies in the background, leaving us absolutely flabbergasted. Uh, this probably was overshadowed by the Artemis 1 rollout, which is a shame. But if this image is anything to go on by, uh, we're going to be getting some pretty uh, bamboozling images over the next few years. Even more good news, although it requires an apology. Last week, I claimed, like the little whippersnapper that I am, that we could have a spacewalk this week performed by Kayla Barron and Roger Chari. Well, I was wrong. Today, as we're recording this on the 23rd of March, we have had a spacewalk, but it's performed by Roger Chari and Matthias Mora. Unfortunately, Kayla Barron isn't involved. And I should have known this, but I got it wrong, and I apologise. According to NASA, the plan of this spacewalk is to install hoses on a radiator beam valve module that routes ammonia through the station's heat-rejecting radiators to keep systems at their proper temperature. They will also install a power and data cable on the Columbus module's Bartomeu science platform, they will also replace an external camera on the station's truss and conduct other upgrades to the station hardware. Hopefully they're going to achieve all of that. It's happening right now as we're recording, but that does seem like an awful lot for one space war. Yeah, that made me tired just looking. I was like, I was like um, I'm wearing a shirt that my naps shirt today. So yeah, I, I, I was like, I need a nap after reading all that. Damn. Yeah. Damn. Okay. Um, speaking of naps, no, I'm joking. Uh, meanwhile, <laughs> meanwhile on Mars, the Ingenuity helicopter has completed its 22nd flight, which is awesome, and it's been announced. Amazing. Yeah, it wasn't supposed to go this long, and it has. And it's been announced that it's going to keep flying until September at least. Extraordinary levels of overachievement there. Yeah, absolutely, right? Uh, back on Earth. It seems last week I was really speaking codswallop. But in my defense, this information was correct at the time. Uh, I reported that Pete Davidson, the comedian, was due to fly on the next Blue Origin suborbital flight. Well, the flight got delayed until next week, and he was un unavailable for the next date. So he's been replaced by Gary Lay, who is currently the senior director and chief architect of New Shepard, uh, the rocket. I love the fact he's get to go up on his own rocket. And I, I wonder how many other rocket architects have flown on their rockets because I can't think of any off the top of my head. But I'm I'm happy to be proved wrong here. Yeah, I, I can't think of any. Um, Von Braun never got to fly on. <laughs> Korolev. Korolev never, definitely didn't. Definitely did not. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think. Space shuttle. I, I wouldn't say the person who designed the shuttle probably got to fly on it. I mean, John Young didn't yeah. design it. He just was a pilot. So... Yeah, I can't think of any. That's really a cool little milestone there. That's really neat. Yeah. He definitely yeah, deserves yeah. it. That's for sure. For sure. That's for sure. For sure. And finally, we've got plenty of news coming out from SpaceX. Elon Musk has said that the huge Starship rocket might have its first orbital flight attempt in May. They're currently waiting for an environmental review from the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration. And assuming that's all done, they're ready to go. Also, the Crew-4 mission, which will launch on a Falcon 9 rocket next month, has a new Dragon capsule, and it's been announced that this one is being named Freedom. This will be the fourth Crew Dragon capsule in operation. The others were named Endeavor, Resilience, and Endurance. Endeavor was the first capsule. Uh, I'm not sure if you saw this, Dave, but a trailer has been released for a new Netflix documentary coming out on April 7th called Return to Space, and it's all about the launch of Endeavour back in May 2020 with astronauts Doug Hurley and Bob Benkin on board. 
that was our big event of 2020. So I'm really looking forward to watching that. Yeah, I did see the trailer. It got me quite excited. Got me quite emotional, if I'm honest, because that event was such a big deal, wasn't it? I remember sitting right in this very seat watching it and and thoroughly enjoying it in the middle of that first lockdown of the pandemic. Oh, it yeah. really w- was just an amazing event. Yeah, that was a rough time and that greatly kind of improved everything. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So that's it for this week. And we hoped you enjoyed the look at the moon trees and a little bit of a chat about Stu Rooster as well. I hope it was a fitting tribute for our friend George. Yes. And um, of course, we really do want to send our condolences to his wife, Linda, and the rest of his family and close friends. And we are thinking of you all. Absolutely. A big thanks to all of you for listening. It really does mean a lot. March, for some reason, we've smashed our records. And we're not really sure how or why, but thank you for listening. And and thanks to those of you who got in contact about the podcast appearing on Facebook. Weirdly, I can't reply to anyone who responds to who posts oh, comments wow. underneath the podcast. That's weird. It's, it's yeah, it's really weird. Yeah. It's really people can post comments on it. I can't reply to them. So keep posting comments on it and hopefully we'll get there in the end anyway let us know when you start seeing that on your news feeds if you've hit the subscribe button as well and a massive thanks to all who continue to support us on patreon uh dave told me he did a stock take of our t-shirts this week and we're running low on some sizes so maybe check mm. out our selection on our website uh space and things podcast.com but don't forget in space no one can hear you me Space and Things has been brought to you by And Things Productions.